But Dr. White, you're getting very impassioned about your Trinitarianism in 1 Corinthians 8. But you're not hearing, although you're very ready to accuse the Unitarian people, by the way, it's not me solo. <laughs> I'm sure you have enough knowledge of the literature in German and French and English to know that what I'm saying is well established in scholarly circles. You brush too quickly over the Shema by saying that the Lord our God is one. You don't say the Lord our God is one Lord. I'm asking you now to count carefully. How many Lords are there there? One Lord. Kyrios e sestin. And then when you get to 1 Corinthians 8, 6, all of that is discarded, although you try to connect it in some way. It isn't clear what you're doing. How in the world do you get from one Lord to two Lords in the Shema? That's pretty amazing. But one Lord there in the Shema, in Deuteronomy, you've got one person. The Lord our God is one Lord. It's not two persons. That's one person. The Lord our God is that one Lord God. Yahweh is the one Lord God. You also say that Yahweh is the Father, Yahweh is the Son, Yahweh is the Holy Spirit. You cannot have three Yahwehs making one Yahweh. Now you admit to that contradiction in your own book. You say, you warn us that you cannot do that with language. You can't say, Jesus is Yahweh, Father is Yahweh, Holy Spirit is Yahweh, that makes one Yahweh. But you're doing that very thing. You keep telling us that Jesus is Yahweh, and now you're saying the Father is Elohim, and Jesus is Yahweh. That's exactly what the Mormons say, incidentally. I heard it from a Mormon professor just the other day. No, this is much, much easier. The biblical view of God is that God is one single person. The Lord our God is one single Lord. Please note, Echad means one single. One and only one, one and not more than one. That established then, who is Jesus in 1 Corinthians 8, 6? Now, this is not very difficult. We admit absolutely that Jesus is the supremely exalted human being at the right hand of the Father, given all kinds of authority, all authority, next to the one God. Been given that, by the way, it's been conferred upon him. And so Paul therefore says, to us Christians there is one God the Father, and no other God but he. That's exactly what the scribe said in Mark 12. The same language exactly, all based on Deuteronomy 6, exactly what Jesus agreed to. I give it to you again. There's only one God come of the Father and no other God except He. How many does that sound like? One, of course. Now there is also the one Lord Messiah, Jesus. And what you're missing here is that there are two Lords in Scripture. Psalm 110.1, Yahweh speaks to Adonai. You're overlooking the fact that I think a hundred times in the New Testament, Jesus is the Lord Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Christ, not the Lord God. And Luke, who was a travelling companion of Paul, and they agreed with each other, obviously, makes it very clear, if you'd read carefully the, the narratives of the birth of Jesus, the origin of Jesus, Luke speaks of Jesus as being the Lord Messiah in Luke 2.11. That Lord Messiah was born. Nobody in New Testament times thought God got born. That's really a stretch. No, the Lord Messiah is very clear there. Let's go flat out on 1 Corinthians 8, 4 to 6. Paul there is repeating the Shema, repeating the Shema of Deuteronomy 6, repeating the conversation between Jesus and the Jew, where there's only one person, one Lord. That's who God is. The Lord our God is one single, one only Lord. Now who is this other Lord then next to God? It's the Lord Messiah. James White seems struck down by the idea of the Lord Messiah. Where's that? Well, Luke 2.11, of course. And about a hundred times in the New Testament, we have our Lord Jesus Christ, or the Lord Jesus Christ. Not the Lord God Jesus. That's un unbelievable. No, he's the Lord Christ. Now, the Lord Christ is our Lord Jesus. Very often, about 50 times in Paul. Please note that our Yahweh is an impossibility in language. The fact that Paul speaks of Jesus as our Lord tells us flat out that he's not talking about our Yahweh Jesus. That's just impossible. 
So that point must be tackled head on. Yahweh cannot have a personal pronoun. My Yahweh, our Yahweh, is a linguistic impossibility. And therefore when Paul can speak of Jesus as our Lord, by definition he's not referring to him as Yahweh. After all, that makes two Yahwehs. That would contradict the Shema, where God is declared to be one single Lord, not two. That second Lord, of course, is derived from Psalm 110.1, where the second Lord is Adonai, and despite Dr. White's valiant attempts to get rid of that, that text is still there. And we know that even in the time of Jerome and the time of Origen, the word Adonai and Adonai are perfectly clear. You see, Dr. James White to told us that those points mean nothing. Well, they're there in the Masoretic text, but they're there much earlier than that. And let him think about this. The Septuagint, which is dated B.C. times, is fully aware of the distinction between Kyrios and Kyrios Mu. Over 120 times, Kyrios Mu is Adonai. Now, I'm assuming, of course, that Dr. James Dunn has been carefully read all of his works in discussing Christology. Few people have done as much work as he. On page 109 of his latest book, Did the First Christians Worship Jesus? We read this. The point is not so clear, this business of splitting the Shema, uh, dividing it between God and Jesus. Not as clear as Baalcom suggests, for the question arises as to whether Paul did indeed intend to split the Shema. It's quite possible to argue alternatively, and I'm arguing alternatively here, that Paul took up the Shema, already quoted in 8.4, 4 Corinthians 8.4, there's no God but one, only one God the Father, only in the first clause of 8.6. And in that second clause, he added the further confession, and one Lord Jesus Messiah. Now that's not splitting the Shema. That is laying alongside the one God of Israel, a second person. And Jews could do that. They could allow supreme beings to be next to God, but certainly not to the point of interfering with the sole, unique one God who is said to be the Father and nobody else beside him. Now here's the point I think the public will be very interested in. In Hebrew, one cannot say my Yahweh or our Yahweh. That's impossible. Now in the New Testament, a hundred times or so, we have Jesus as our Lord, sometimes the Lord Jesus Christ, but very often, I think up to about 50 times in Paul, perhaps less than that, but a significant number of times, our Lord Jesus Christ is the standard way of describing Jesus as our Lord. Our Lord, I want to tell the public clearly, cannot be our Yahweh. That's simply a language impossibility. Nowhere in the 7,000 odd occurrences of Yahweh in the Old Testament, the divine name, is he ever our or my Yahweh. So when we're speaking of our Lord Jesus Christ, we're talking about the Lord, absolutely, but not the Lord Yahweh. At the simplest level, of course, this is simply to say, this is an elementary fact, that two Yahwehs is one too many. The creed advocated by Jesus in agreement with that Jew in Mark 12 is that the Lord our God, that's a single person, is one Lord. That shouldn't be too hard. The later development, turning God into three, was a very unfortunate development and has caused all sorts of chaos and confusion and antagonized millions of Jews and a billion Muslims. We need to get over that. Now, if anyone's in any doubt about who it is who's sitting at the right hand of God, 
Not another God, not another Yahweh making two Yahwehs. It's the Son of Man. Jesus said himself, you'll see the Son of Man sitting. The human being, capital H, capital B, the human being sitting at the right hand of the Father. Stephen saw the same in Acts 7 when he died. It was the Son of Man. That's perfectly clear. Again, that's an absolute confirmation of Paul in 1 Timothy 2, 5. One God the Father, one mediator next to that one God the Father, but not another God. The mediator, the man, the human being, the son of man, Messiah, the Adonai of Psalm 110.1, it all fits beautifully. And we shouldn't really have to have this discussion, but the church went badly astray from the second century on when it ventured the idea that there was another divine pre-existing being leading ultimately to the fearful and awful complexities of Trinitarian doctrine.